Yeah. Hello. I am going to talk to you today about the exciting topic of large scale data study. And you may ask why it's important. Well, at the moment, uh, PubMed alone has 23 million articles published. Every year, 500,000 will be added at least. And so, but also what's going to happen as we learned uh, this morning and yesterday, that genomic data is becoming cheap. So everybody will soon have this genome sequence and then it could be connected to the hospital data so that we can see if people have genes that are causing allergic reaction of drugs, they don't get the drugs. And in my project, I'm just concentrating on mining PubMed and I looked this morning and I found that we have 23, uh, 23 million articles. So now I look up the speed of um, tagging, which is classifying words into different categories, and the maximum speed is about 22,000 words per minute, uh, per second. So if we would go in that speed, if we ran it on a single machine, it would be 8.3 years. So by that time, we have 4 million more articles. <laughs> so, and now I tell you a little bit about um, word tagging. There is a, a software, it's called the Brill Tagger, developed by Eric Brill from Denmark. And he is one of the geniuses in that's mind. He's one of the gurus. And he basically wrote rules that classify the words based on their grammar in 36 categories in English. But since he's originally Danish, Danish even has more. So these are the categories that he classified them. And basically assigning these small abbreviations to a word is called tagging. And now here we see the output of the tagger. One can basically copy paste a text in on a little submission window in the internet and then it will tag it. And the output will look something like that. So basically every word is given its abbreviation and surprisingly it can reach an accuracy up to 97%. So basically we know that grammar is very structured, it has rules, and with machine learning, we can pretty much recognize the pattern. And that's actually surprising because first I thought language is arbitrarily, it got developed historically, but it works. So now what the Brill Tagger does, it categorizes the, no wait, just Genia Corpus. Genia Corpus can also be downloaded, and it is based on dictionary and categorizes the words into these different classes by looking them up in a dictionary. <coughs> and that is how the output looks like. So we have for each class of word, we have a color. And then based on the colors, one can tell what kind of word it is. So you may wonder what is that good for? I mean, first of all, people reading PubMed and not being expert in biologists, they can distinguish between chemical, protein, disease, but that's only a minor application. I will explain you the much more promising application soon. So another software that can use is Avner. Avner stands for a biomedical name entity recognizer, and it works exactly at the same uh, principle as Genia Corpus, and on the bottom you can see its categories. However, the categories can be chosen arbitrarily by the user. It is just what they decided to do. So, now, many people have worked on text mining for a long time because it is very promising. There is even some estimation that if we could read the entire internet, if we could make it machine readable, we might be close to immortality. Because Researchers, they can only read a limited amount, and it is sometimes luck if they read two articles where it says A reacts to C, another one says B reacts to C, consequently A influences B. And that we want machines to do for us. So now, so far, I'm not aware 
of any approach that has used multiple machines in order to reduce the time of 8.3 years. So that's basically what we are trying to do in my capstone project. And we basically want to train the model on dictionary, but later on, we don't want to use them, we want to see whether we can do it statistically. And this is basically how we are planning to split the work. So on the very left, you have, let's say, these are three PubMed articles. We are distributing it to um, three different machines. So that's called splitting. So then we are mapping it. Basically, each word becomes a value. And in the beginning, its key is number one. So because it basically tells how often a word occurs. So then we do shuffling, which is more like a sorting that sorts it alphabetically and groups the words of the same kind together. After that is the reducing step, where basically only unique words are listed, and each unique word, which is the key, <coughs> has a value of how often it occurs, and then we get the output. And we are basing that on the Hidden Markov model, which has been proven very successful in many times in speech recognition, in um, identifying genes, identifying genomic pattern, and how it basically works, we can assume that on the top C axis are different states. So in, in my case, it would be like chemical, protein, and cell part. So then each state can transition into any other state. So it can be transitioned in another chemical, in another protein, and these transitions have statistical significance. So this is what the hidden Markov model needs as input. It needs a um, initial probability, which has to be set, then it needs a transition probability matrix and an emission probability matrix. And um, our goal is to build something similar to a genia corpus using dictionaries that are already available, but our classification is different. So we are wanting to classify it in proteins, chemicals, body parts, cells, and nucleotides, organisms, events, and very important non-entity, because all these, the words that are nothing, they also are part of the transition pattern that needs to be considered. So now plus the 36 different kinds of words are called a Markov chain, and based on, we train the model only once on a dictionary, so it will remember the Markov chain, and if it finds words, it can, based on the Markov chain, predict what class that word would be. And even if we are not getting totally away from dictionaries, let's say we have seven dictionaries for each of my seven classes. Text 
take it uh, wants to do tagging for economic terms or for legal terms or for insurance terms. They can upload their dictionary and um, classify their own categories and assign them a color and that way they are not limited to biomedical things. What? Okay, oh, good. So, um, so, and then we are also running just to basically get an idea of comparison because I mean, we need some results. So we are using five machine learning algorithms and we want to compare them, see how well they do. So far, I'm guessing HHM will do best. Um, I've already run them on a single machine, and surprisingly, KNN did best. Even so, KNN is probably the simplest mechanism. So, and, um, in the future, um, if we can expand this project, but that will not be part of my master's project, we are thinking of building relationships between the entities. When we say um, protein A catalyzes um, protein B. So, Basically, what, what is important is that these flowcharts that we want to develop, the how, which reacts with what, it takes at the moment lots of labor. People have to read the articles. And I believe with the software, we can probably not get an accurate, precise um, flowchart of the um, reactions, but we could get pretty close, and then we have an idea of what we look for and can verify it much faster. And And then what um, is another goal is, what I already mentioned in the beginning, is that, um, see, what you know is that many drugs are very, very promising, but they never reach the market because a small percentage of patients has allergic or even lethal reaction to it. So now all the other, like 99%, can benefit from it just because of 1%. But now we know that either the lack of genes a lack of enzyme to detoxify it, or a presence of a gene causing an allergic reaction is basically responsible for these unwanted <coughs> side effects. So once we know exactly by what they are caused, we can exclude those patients that would show allergic reaction, and that probably we would be able to increase the number of drugs by a factor of 10, because CBC, lots of drugs are promising in the mouse model, lots of uh, clinical trials are in humans, but they get aborted because of negative reactions, which, when we combine all this data, can be predicted and thus avoided. And also another application is, um, when you go to a doctor, what I realize with doctors, is that they go to med school, they learn a certain set of medication, they keep applying and applying and applying, but they don't really read what's new. So now, if uh, the computer can analyze PubMed, it can basically, on the frequency, tell that for a certain disease, it has been determined that another drug is more effective, so the doctor just needs the output without ever having to be PubMed. So <laughs> basically, we can gather information, but if we don't extract it, it has no value. And I think that is what my project wants to contribute to. Oh, there's more. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah, I already said that. That's um, basically personalized medicine. I already explained that. Okay, now I'm open to question, but
um, adenosine triphosphate as two separate words meaning the same thing, basically being class of the nucleotide. And that's what makes it so hard. That's why, despite many people working on it, we still have a problem because people have different vocabulary, people have different word styles. Like if we go by probability, and um, what you can see is that American publishers, American scientists, why a little different than Japanese or Dutch scientists? So then that changes the entire pattern of <laughs> Markov chains.